environment, and if it holds up under scrutiny, the Utah discovery could pave the way for an unlimited, clean, and cheap supply of energy for the entire world. There are two types of nuclear energy, fusion and fission. The most familiar is nuclear fission. That's when two atoms are split apart. The power and energy that result from this split were first seen in the atomic bomb that devastated Japan during World War II. Today, nuclear fission is relatively commonplace, produced and controlled in nuclear reactors. But it's expensive and has many drawbacks, especially safety. Ten years ago, the Three Mile Island nuclear reactor in Pennsylvania leaked massive amounts of radiation into the environment. More recently, the nuclear accident at Chernobyl killed 31 and injured thousands. It was recently revealed that the vegetables grown in the countryside around the nuclear reactor are still contaminated with radiation almost three years after the accident. Also, the radioactive waste, which results from fission, is extremely dangerous and costly to dispose of. And the question of where to dump it has become a major environmental battle. Nuclear fusion, on the other hand, has few such problems. Fusion occurs when atoms collide. This fusion releases tremendous power and energy. Fusion is what makes a hydrogen bomb explode. But unlike atomic energy, scientists have been unable to convert fusion into practical use, an effort they've pursued for the past 35 years. The advantages of fusion are many. It's less radioactive, therefore the waste disposal problem is reduced, if not almost eliminated. And the power released by fusion would be inexpensive and abundant, capable of supplying the energy needs of the entire world. Here with us now to explain their work and its implications are the two researchers. Stanley Pons is a professor of chemistry at the University of Utah. His collaborator is Martin Fleischmann, a professor of electrochemistry at the University of Southampton in England. Gentlemen, to you both, congratulations. Your discovery is being hailed as a breakthrough. Professor Pons, how accurate is that? Well, it's, uh, it certainly is a breakthrough in the field of nuclear fusion. Uh, we have a, a cell which is comprised simply of a block of metal which is immersed in uh, deuterium oxide, which is heavy water. Uh, and the amount of heavy water present on the Earth, of course, is enormous. It's virtu virtually an, uh, an inexhaustible uh, source of, of fuel, if it can be used for a fuel. He heavy the water is, what, what makes it heavy water? I mean. Well, each, and, uh, unlike normal water, where each of the hydrogen atoms uh, in, in the water have uh, a single proton, heavy water, uh, the hydrogen atoms in, a, in heavy water have uh, both a proton and a neutron. Each mm -hmm. one of them do. Mm -hmm. So it's a heavy isotope, if you like, of, uh, of water. And you were saying? OK, the, uh, in this particular cell, we use an electrical current to change the water into uh, deuterium gas, the heavy water into deuterium uh, atoms, rather. These are then forced into the uh, lattice, the metal lattice, by the current and are highly compressed in that lattice. Uh, they are compressed to the point and are retained uh, close enough to each other for a long enough time that atomic fusion occurs. All right, I want to get into the details of that experiment in the, in the simplest terms possible in a couple of minutes, but let me just ask you, uh, Mr. Fleischmann, this is also being hailed as the ideal energy source. Is that the case? Yes, there would be many advantages in using it as an energy source because as was referred to in the run-in to this program, the reaction would be clean, the fuel supply would be, and as Professor Pons has said, the fuel supply would be plentiful, and it could, in this embodiment, be carried out, we think, in a very simple manner. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the fuel supply being inexhaustible, does that relate to this heavy water? Yes, the content of heavy water in the sea. In the, in the, the sea, because as I read it this afternoon, it was the, the prevalence of seawater uh, that, that made the supply so inexhaustible. Yes, it's, it's the content of heavy water in the sea, in the natural water in the sea, which would be the fuel in this instance. Does it indeed have the potential of transforming the world's energy source, energy supply? Well, if the... Uh, if, it, if the engineering 
problems can be solved, certainly, yes. Is that a big if? Hmm? I beg your pardon? Is that a big if? You said if well, the... Well, in any scientific investigation, in any investigation, there are always the problems of the science, and then there are the technical problems. But, of course, we do not see such massive technical problems in this instance as there might be in some of the other approaches which have been tried so far. Now, you've described this process as ridiculously simple, something that could be done in a freshman chemistry class. Mr. Pons, in the simplest of terms, how, how exactly... Y you did this in the kitchen, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think the kitchen thing has been blown up a little bit today. Well, it's pretty anyway, sexy. <laughs> Maybe that's why. Yeah. Anyway, the, uh, uh, it's, a, it's the simplest of electrochemical cells. It, it contains two electrodes. It contains a large uh, palladium electrode uh, it uh, that serves as the uh, device for containing the deuterium. Uh, it contains uh, another electrode, an anode, which is wrapped around that, but electrically isolated uh, from it except uh, by the solution between them. Mm -hmm. And you simply pass a current between the two uh, electrodes. How did, you know you were uh, how, how did you know you were creating nuclear fusion? Well, first by the enormous amount of heat uh, that was generated, there is no known chemical process or other process that we're aware of that could explain such huge amounts of energy. Uh, and subsequent to that, we have detected particles uh, that are associated with nuclear fusion reactions over and above uh, normal background. In the How laboratory. long did this go on? I mean, I in time. You mean the running of the cell? Right. Uh, we have sustained cells for several hundred hours uh, over the last few years. This, uh, the latest experiments we're running have been running one or two hundred hours uh, at, at very high energy outputs. 